Good evening and uh, welcome to our midweek Bible study as we continue our series on discovering our spiritual gifts and tonight we want to begin to look specifically at the gift of prophecy. So let's have a word of prayer shall we and uh, just commit our time to the Lord so that he might speak to our hearts. Lord uh, we give you praise and thanks Lord for this opportunity to be able to meet around your word Lord even though we're not uh, meeting physically together as such we are meeting uh, in spirit and uh, Lord uh, we thank you for those who've tuned in uh, Lord who um, are participating in this Bible study and we ask Father that uh, it might be a blessing to uh, each heart Lord that listens we pray Father that uh, Lord you'd help me to get uh, this recorded and then uploaded uh, to the internet in time for our Bible study and I ask Father that uh, you'd help me to clearly uh, be able to explain uh, some of these things Lord that we're going to look at tonight and we ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. All right we're going to uh, begin with this passage in Romans chapter 12 uh, which has to do with the motivational gifts so it says, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So there we see the different uh, gifts uh, below. You, hopefully you can see those letters coming up, the various different gifts that God has given to us. It says having then gifts. So you do have a gift, at least one gift, and uh, those gifts differ one from another. Uh, so my gift is maybe different to your gift uh, and uh, uh, there may be several different gifts uh, in your family. I know in my family one of the fun things to do is try and work out what the spiritual, the motivational spiritual gift is uh, in each of uh, the family members, those ones who are saved of course. So um, in any case, uh, there's our passage of scripture that we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at the first one there, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So last time we spoke about the motivational gifts of Romans chapter 12, we sort of divided up each of those gifts uh, into the, the motivation of the heart of the person who receives each of those gifts, the motivation that they have in their, their lives. Uh, and the, uh, we saw that the prophets are driven to keep the church straight. So that's their role in the church. Uh, no one has to tell them that they have to do that. It's just something that is innately given to them. That's something that they are driven to do to try and keep the church straight. In other words, righteous uh, before the Lord to keep people uh, on the right path as it were. And then the ministers or the servants are prompted to keep the church served. So they see physical needs. Where there's a physical need, they don't just neglect it, but uh, they show initiative and they do what needs to be done to meet that physical need. Uh, the teachers are those who are impelled to keep the church scriptural. In other words, scripturally sound so that uh, they are sound in their doctrine. Uh, they're biblical in their doctrine. And so that's the motivation of the teacher. And the exhorters or encouragers, they're moved to keep the church stimulated. That is stimulated uh, in their uh, faith walk. So uh, they're um, uh, excited really about uh, the Christian life and, and wanting to stimulate that same excitement in other people. And then the gift of giving, uh, the givers are spurred to keep the church supplied. So where there is a, a need, uh, givers don't necessarily give to every need, but where they see an important need, then they will give and sometimes give a great deal of money 
uh, towards uh, that particular need. Then rulers or organizers are excited about keeping the church scheduled, or in other words, uh, keeping it so that it's uh, orderly and, and uh, so that it's uh, running smoothly. So uh, they delight to be able to do that. And then, of course, uh, the mercies, uh, they're animated about keeping the church supported, particularly those ones. Not, we're not talking about financial support there. We're talking about people who are undergoing some sort of suffering, that uh, they're uh, supported emotionally and uh, they know that uh, someone cares uh, for them. So they're the different uh, motivations. And as you can see, I've put the words driven, prompted, impelled, moved, spurred, excited, and animated there as synonyms of uh, the word motivation. So um, the, these people, the people who have these gifts are motivated in that uh, in those specific areas. Now, your spiritual gift influences your perspective or how you see life, how you see ministry, how you see the Christian life. If each of the seven motivational gifts were represented at a church lunch and someone dropped the dessert on the floor, here is how each person with a particular spiritual gift might respond and what motivates them to respond in that way. I get this from uh, an interesting uh, little book by uh, uh, IBLP, the Institute in Basic Life Principles, uh, and they go through, give some, uh, some illustrations of how these gifts work in a couple of different situations. So in this situation of someone spilling the cake on the floor, the prophet might respond to that by saying, that's what happens when you're not careful. All right, the prophet's motivation is to correct the problem. Now, obviously you're being careless as you're walking along. Uh, you weren't alert to what was in front of you, so you tripped over and you dropped the, dropped the cake. That's, that might be the response of the prophet. The minister or the servant might say, oh, let me help you clean it up. And of course his motivation or her motivation is to meet a need, particularly a physical need. The teacher might say, well, it fell because it was too heavy on one side, which could have been avoided if you checked the balance of the dish before you lifted it from the counter. And of course, his, his uh, motivation as a teacher and a researcher is to discover why it happened. Then the exhorter might say, here's an opportunity to count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And of course, his motivation is to keep that person positive and looking to the Lord uh, and uh, seeing that uh, nothing happens by accident, but uh, God is, uh, is sovereign over all things and you can trust him despite what goes on in our circumstances. The giver then would say, well, I'll, I'll be happy to go and buy a new dessert. And of course, his motivation is to provide for a tangible need. Uh, using his finances to do so. The ruler or the organizer might say, Jim, go and get a garbage bin. Sally, you move the chairs back so that we can mop. Fred, you pick up the broken pieces of crockery. And of course, uh, his or her motivation is to help the group work together to achieve their immediate goal, which of course is to clean up the mess in this particular case. And then the mercy finally uh, might say, don't feel bad, it could happen to anyone. And of course, his or her motivation is to comfort the person responsible for the mess, offer sympathy and relieve embarrassment. So that's the that's uh, typical of what a mercy might say. Now, they may not say those words exactly. Uh, in fact, sometimes they might not say anything. But um, uh, this is sort of typical of what uh, someone with one of those gifts might say. In another situation, uh, if seven Christians, each of whom had a different motivational gift, visited a sick friend in hospital, the following examples indicate how each of them might respond based on the perspective of his or her motivational spiritual gift. So the prophet in this case might come in and visit it and say, look, I'm concerned about your situation. Do you know what God is trying to say to you through this condition? Is there some sin in your life that you need to confess and forsake? 
So in the prophet's mind, he's probably thinking uh, this is uh, quite possibly uh, the result of God's chastening in this person's life. And uh, so I'm just going to help this person by prodding a little to see if they need to get something right uh, in their life. The minister or the servant might say, here's a little gift. I remembered how much you enjoyed this CD when you were at my house last year. And I thought you might enjoy listening to it when you get to feeling a little better. Don't worry about a thing at home because I've taken care of your mail. I've watered your plants, washed your dishes. I asked your neighbor if she'd be willing to keep an eye on your house and feed your dog while you're in hospital. And, and by the way, is there anything else I can do for you while you're laid up? So the, the person with the gift of serving uh, is really about uh, ministering to others in physical ways, uh, doing what they can. It's not a burden to them. It's not a chore to them. It's just they see it as a, as a, a means of being able to love someone and care for someone. And so uh, this is uh, typical of what a servant or a minister would, uh, would say. And then the teacher, the person with the spiritual gift of teaching, might say, hey, I did some research about your condition and I conferred with, the, uh, with your doctor when I saw him out at the nurse's station. I believe I can help you understand exactly what the problem is and how the medical staff plans to treat it. So again, the teacher is interested in how things work and uh, why things work and uh, how to, how to uh, go about uh, uh, bringing about change. Okay, the exhorter. Uh, might come along and say, hey, it's exciting. God has given you this opportunity to trust him. I've been much in prayer for you and I'm confident that God will show you how all things work together for good so that you'll be able to help others in the future. All right, that's typical of the exhorter. For those of you who know my mother-in-law, uh, you would know her, uh, that she has uh, the gift of exhortation. And she's very much the optimist and excited when uh, I know there's many times uh, when things might not be going so well. And she comes along and she's excited about the fact that God's doing going to do something spectacular, uh, something amazing, despite the fact that everything looks so dark. So it's good to have an exhorter along. And then, of course, the giver, the giver might say, well, I want you to know that while you're in hospital, I've decided to pay your regular bills, such as your rent, your family's meal expenses, and petrol costs for them to come and visit you while you're getting better. I would have preferred to meet these needs anonymously, but I felt the Lord directed me to go ahead and let you know about his provision so that you can concentrate on getting well and not on how you're going to pay these other bills. So that's typical of a giver. Givers like to give anonymously. They don't like uh, anyone to, to know that they're giving necessarily. Uh, and uh, uh, But there are those times when, uh, as in this particular case, uh, it's important to let them know uh, that uh, the, uh, they don't need to be worried about uh, financial uh, burdens and things like that. Then the ruler or the organizer might say, well, my friend, your assignment is to get well as fast as possible. Don't worry about the Jamison project that you are handling either. I've distributed your responsibilities among the other team members and they're reporting to me daily. Hurry up and get out here, or get out of here so that you can help me get the Fredrickson project started. So obviously that's a workmate, uh, but a Christian one who has that gift of ruling. And uh, so they've, they've organized things. Then the mercy might say, oh, you poor dear. I was so sad to hear about your accident. How are you feeling today? Any better? Let me pray for you right now. I, uh, I know a number of people with the gift of mercy and I was talking to one just the other day and uh, she was mentioning that she heard uh, about a very a sad situation about uh, a, a particular uh, Christian who had fallen and uh, her response uh, when she was told was that she just she wept the whole day. Uh, she was uh, very sad for her, for, for that um, uh, brother actually in Christ. And uh, uh, not a physical brother, but a spiritual brother in Christ. 
Uh, so that's typical of a mercy. Uh, in another resource, uh, a teacher by the name of Russell Kelfer, in uh, a book about discovering your spiritual gifts, he describes how a person with each motivational gift would respond to a fellow believer's, how they would respond to a fellow believer's testimony. So if they had the opportunity, so for example in church or uh, some special meeting, and someone got up and shared their testimony, how each gift would, would perceive how the testimony affects his particular area of expertise. So for example, to a prophet, a testimony is primarily about how someone deals with sin and how they get it right. And then to a minister or a servant, a testimony is primarily about how someone handles availability. To a teacher, a testimony is primarily about how someone handles doctrine and how they get to understand the truth uh, of the Word of God. Uh, to an exhorter, a testimony is primarily about how someone handles trials and uh, how they learn different principles and follow principles uh, from the Word of God to help them to overcome those trials. And then to a giver, a testimony is primarily about how someone handles resources. Resources are very important to a giver that they were used in a proper way. And so uh, if the testimony includes the right use of resources, then that's a great blessing to someone who is a giver. To a ruler, a testimony is primarily about how someone delegates or organizes successfully. If they can put things in the right place and if they're orderly uh, in, in, uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, what uh, God did in that person's life, then they're happy about that. The picture here of this girl who's giving a testimony, she's actually giving a testimony about giving and uh, she's uh, talking about uh, how she learned to tithe. And uh, of course, uh, the giver would be particularly happy about that. But the ruler also would be uh, pleased with that testimony because of the fact that uh, she is organizing her, her resources. She's organizing uh, the amount of money that uh, she has come in. Uh, and despite uh, the various difficulties and challenges of life, she's uh, going to put God first and and give that tithe. Then to the merciful, a testimony is primarily about how someone responds to the hurt of other people. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's important, even more, more so than their own uh, hurts, how they uh, help other people who are suffering or going through some sort of trial. Now perhaps uh, just with these uh, different illustrations that uh, we've been going through, perhaps you were already able to identify which one of these ways of looking at the spiritual life is yours. However, we'll take a deeper look into each motivational gift to see what it looks like in people's lives who have that gift. Now, we won't have time to do all of them tonight. In fact, we're only going to start on the first one, which is the gift of prophecy. So we begin with the gift of prophecy. Here's a good picture of a prophet in the Old Testament. He's preaching away. He's proclaiming the, uh, the truth of God's word. And uh, we see people listening to him. We see some people repenting. Uh, they're getting down there and praying. And others uh, perhaps uh, getting ready to throw a rock or something. I don't know. But uh, in any case, that's a good picture of a prophet. So the words prophet, prophesy, and prophesying are used in the Bible 575 times. So that's quite a lot of times that we find the word prophet. They're not always in the Old Testament either because the words occur 202 times in the New Testament and that's over a third of the times that they are used in the Bible. So in the Old Testament, you know, we have the major prophets and we have the minor prophets so what do you expect to find the words prophet or prophesy or prophesying many times in the Old Testament? But we don't expect it as much in the New Testament. But there it is, a third of the times that the words are used, it's found in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we find that there were two ministries uh, of priest and prophet. Some like Samuel fulfilled both callings of priest and prophet. And the difference between the two callings was that, first of all, 
The priest represented the people before God. The priest, by offering sacrifices and other offerings, uh, appealed to God on man's behalf. So the sacrifice, uh, the sin offering, for example, the shedding of blood was offered uh, so that, uh, uh, of course, the blood was a picture of the blood of Christ and that was offered uh, in order that uh, God would be uh, appeased for man's sin. So we see that the priest uh, would come and make those sacrifices uh, to appeal to God on man's behalf. The prophet, however, he represented God before the people, the very opposite of the priest. And so he appealed to man on God's behalf and let uh, man know what God's expectations were. We often find that, particularly in the Old Testament, we find uh, that God again and again through the prophets reminds the people about God's expectations of their lives. As such, the prophet was a spokesman for God and his truth. Most of the time, the prophet simply declared the word of God with the desire to see people turn back to, to him, that is to God. The Bible itself is a book of prophecy. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. That means more certain or more sure than any experience we can, we can have. Uh, we see that in the context of the passage of Scripture where Peter is talking about the experience that he had uh, up on the Mount of Transfiguration where the Lord was transfigured before him. He heard the voice of the Father. Uh, what an uh, experience to have. And yet he says we have a more sure, a more certain word of prophecy, uh, speaking of the scriptures. And he says, Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter goes on in the next two verses to define what he means by a word of prophecy. So he says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, that uh, expression, private interpretation, needs a little bit of explanation. Private there means originating from one's own self. So, in other words, uh, it's, it's saying that uh, uh, no prophecy of the scripture uh, comes from uh, a man's thoughts, their own thoughts, their own creativity, uh, their own plans or whatever. Uh, it, it comes through God. And then interpretation. In this particular case, it doesn't refer to the expounding uh, or unfolding of a particular passage of the Bible. Uh, the Greek word is epilusis, which means a releasing in the sense of divine inspiration. So we're talking here that no prophecy of the scriptures of uh, man's inspiration, uh, but rather it's God's inspiration. And then it goes on to explain, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Spirit of God is the author of the scriptures. So when it talks about the prophecy, the word of prophecies, not just talking about prophecies of things to come that uh, is being mentioned here, but rather the whole word of God. So this word of prophecy includes the foretelling of events and their fulfillment. Uh, according to the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy by J. Barton Payne, there are 1,003, uh, sorry, 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament and 578 prophecies in the New Testament for a total of 1,817 prophecies of foretold events. And then these prophecies are contained in 8,352 of the Bible's verses and since there are 31,124 verses in the Bible, the 8,352 verses that contain prophecy constitute 26.8% of the Bible's volume. That's over a quarter of the Bible is foretelling events. Now, some of those events have already uh, been fulfilled, uh, such as the um, information about what would happen to uh, the city of Tyre, that's quite an amazing uh, prophecy and a fulfillment, and there's others as well. Um, but uh, 
a quarter of the Bible, a half of a half of the Bible is uh, foretelling events, a prof prophecy in that sense. And that means that three quarters of the word of prophecy does not include the foretelling of events and their fulfillment. So the rest of the word of prophecy is for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, uh, truly furnished unto all good works. So that's uh, one of the, or that's uh, some of the purposes of the word of prophecy, uh, very practical uh, things, not to, not to telling us about the future, but uh, instruction for what we're to do right now. So uh, prophecy is not only foretelling, but forth telling, or in other words, telling forth the word of God. So we've seen in the last few weeks that the foretelling aspect of prophecy has now failed. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse eight, uh, it says, charity never faileth, but whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. And if you look up the strongest concordance, you find that the word fail there uh, is defined as rendered entirely idle or useless to be abolished, to cease or to be done away, uh, done away with. Perhaps someone should have told the pastors that prophesied that Donald Trump would win the United States election that the foretelling aspect of the gift of prophecy no longer works. There's quite a number of self-proclaimed prophets who uh, prophesied that Donald Trump would win that election. But uh, of course, we know that uh, he didn't. An exception to the idea of uh, foretelling being finished uh, will be during the Great Tribulation time when God will send his two witnesses prophesied in Zechariah chapter 4 who will act in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets like Moses and Elijah. It says in Revelation chapter 11 verses 3 to 6, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, that's three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's what is mentioned in Zechariah chapter four. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, just like Elijah had uh, power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will just like Moses uh, when he was able to turn the water of the Nile to blood and to smite the land of Egypt with various different plagues. So uh, these two witnesses in the future uh, will also have that prophetic gift uh, in, and uh, be enabled to function uh, fully as a, a prophet. And uh, we assume that uh, they also uh, make um, pro prophecies about the future. Uh, but it seems that the forth telling aspect of the prophetic gift of prophecy uh, was finished by the time that Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus. First and second Timothy was written in the 60s AD and Titus was written around 64 to 65 AD, according to uh, various historians. And this is in contrast to 1 Corinthians, which includes the revelatory gifts uh, in chapters 12 through to 14, uh, which was uh, the book of 1 Corinthians was written before 53 AD. So even though it doesn't, it's only about uh, 10 or so years uh, difference, uh, there is a difference in what uh, took place there as far as the availability of the various different types of gifts. In Paul's pastoral epistles, he mentions the bishop or the pastor, uh, the elders, which can include pastors, but also assistant pastors and other leaders in the church, and then deacons. Uh, but he doesn't mention prophets at all, whereas earlier in church history, in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, the leadership included the prophets. It says in Acts 13, 1, 
the first part of the verse, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon. And so it goes on. But we see there the, the teachers and the prophets. But despite the fact that God's foretelling ability for man is finished, God still speaks to us. He speaks to us via his word. That's his primary means whereby he speaks to us today. Matthew 4.4 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Notice that uh, the word proceedeth uh, has E-T-H, which means it's a present tense. Uh, it's continuing to proceed. Every word that proceeds and continues to proceed out of the mouth of God. So when we read God's word, he can speak to our heart. Uh, and uh, you hopefully you know that that is true. And so there's a sense in which uh, whenever someone preaches, they are prophesying because they're uh, speaking forth the word of God. It's, uh, it's uh, their forth telling, telling forth the word of God. So this... Uh, a picture there this is Dr. Kenny Baldwin preaching. He's one of my favorite uh, prophesiers in the sense of preaching or proclaiming uh, the word of God. There he is in, in, uh, in action. And this brings us to our first insight about the motivational gift of prophecy. Since prophecy is proclaiming God's word with a view to helping people to get right with God, we see that someone with a motivational gift of prophecy will be more naturally inclined towards preaching the gospel. When I, when I say naturally, I don't mean it comes natural in the sense that they've always uh, had a natural ability towards that, you know, even before they were saved. Uh, I'm just saying that it's it just seems more natural to someone who has a gift of prophecy to share the gospel with others. The prophet seems to be able to proclaim the gospel without hesitation or embarrassment. Now, it doesn't mean that someone who has a gift of prophecy is naturally an extrovert. Uh, I have a son who is a, I believe, has the gift of prophecy, and he's somewhat of an introvert. But there are times when he will say something uh, just at the right time, and usually it's very powerful. I remember one time. Uh, the children were involved in an Stedford program and they were doing different items. Some were singing, some were quoting uh, poems and things like that. And when he got up to do a, a poem, uh, the impact was amazing. I, I think people just felt convicted uh, after he finished uh, reciting this this poem. Just uh, the look in his eyes as, as well as uh, the intonation of his voice uh, I think uh, there were a few people who were under conviction uh, when he finished reciting uh, this uh, poem that he that he had memorized. So obedient Christians, without this gift of prophecy, they have to work at being obedient to the matter of evangelism. It's as if it doesn't come quite as naturally to them. Uh, we have to. I don't have the gift of prophecy, and uh, and yet I realise that we need to be. Uh, soul winners, we need to try to reach people with the gospel. Just before I came home today, I was able to give a tract to a young man. Uh, and uh, uh, I did that uh, because I know that he needs the gospel. Uh, but uh, a, it would just come more naturally, as it were, to the person with the gift of prophecy. The prophet's burden is to get people right with God. And that outweighs any feelings of awkwardness at bringing the subject up at any time. This is generally speaking. I've known prophets, for example, to give funeral addresses and then at the end of the eulogy to give an altar call to come and get saved. Uh, that's usually a time when uh, you don't give altar calls. Usually you give an altar call in church, uh, but uh, I've known those who have a gift of prophecy to, after they've uh, preached the message, uh, they've not only challenged people to get saved, but they Give them the opportunity there and then to come forward and make it public, make it make it public that they're coming to get saved. Uh, prophets take the opportunity to speak of the gospel 
during uh, any sort of situation. I've thought of this as an example, first aid training. Uh, of course, first aid training has very little to do with spiritual things. Uh, and yet uh, they would very quickly take this opportunity to add E to the doctor's A, B, C, D action plan. You know, you've probably seen if someone, if you find someone and they're, they're unconscious, first of all, you check for danger, see if there's any electric cords or anything like that, or anything that's likely to conk you out from falling from the ceiling. And then uh, you go over and you shake them, see if there's any response. Uh, if there's someone with you, then you can send someone for help. Then you check their airway, you check for their breathing, you begin CPR. And if you have a defibrillator, you begin to uh, apply the defibrillator so that uh, you can get their heart going again. But uh, the person with the gift of prophecy will very quickly add the next point, And that is once they recover, you need to evangelize that person. Uh, so as far as the person with the gift of prophecy is concerned, it's not doctors A, B, C, D, it's doctors A, B, C, D, E, evangelize, because uh, they may not make it the next time. So prophets often take gospel tracts with them wherever they go, and they leave them with whoever they speak to throughout the day. So if they go to the shop, uh, usually the shop attendant gets a tract. If they go to a restaurant, the waitress gets a tract. If they go, uh, you know, it's uh, they're always soul conscious uh, and wanting to uh, share the gospel with others. A second insight about people with a motivational gift of prophecy is that they often have the ability to look down the road and see danger, problems and difficulties ahead that perhaps the rest of us just don't see. In this picture, the little girl here looking down the road. Uh, all we can see as we look at the, the photo is just road uh, going off into the distance. But the uh, person who has that gift of prophecy, uh, they can look at uh, the way someone is living and they can see difficulties ahead for that person unless they change some things in their lives. Some years ago, there was an organization that started with the goal of helping men, Christian men, to lead their homes, to be faithful husbands and fathers, and to be Christian men of integrity. And it seemed like a great idea, but all of a sudden, at the very infancy of the beginning of that movement, there were certain pastors who were known to have a gift of prophecy who began to warn Christian men to avoid that organization. The organization was called Promise Keepers. And in the book, The Seven Promises, of a promise keeper, the goals of the promise keepers were for any male who wants to know his creator better, be closer to his wife and children, to tear down the walls of division, to see the entire world come to know God's love. Well, we could ask what could be wrong with that? And of course, uh, as this picture shows, there were thousands of evangelicals who uh, a lot of them very sincere Christian men who attended these rallies uh, and uh, we can see there uh, that uh, they're very sincere about uh, wanting to be men of integrity, men of character in other words. But then it began to emerge that there was an ecumenical agenda that included uniting with Roman Catholics and Mormons as well. Uh, this book here, Promise Keepers, Another Trojan Horse by uh, Phil Arms, uh, he's bringing out the, the uh, point of uh, the fact that this men's movement was actually a means of uh, uh, uniting all the different churches and uh, uh, not just churches, but all the cults and everyone together, all the religions really together, just like the Bible says in the book of Revelation and the false super church at that time during the tribulation. Uh, charismatic pastor Jack Hayford, he wrote uh, for one of the books uh, or one of the chapters about the promises of the promise keepers. And uh, in the promise, uh, promise number one, he wrote uh, officially, uh, he said, uh, redeeming worship centers on the Lord's table. Whether your tradition celebrates it as communion, Eucharist 
the Mass or the Lord's Supper, we are all called to this centerpiece of Christian worship. Well, that might sound nice, but uh, of course it involves compromise uh, because we are not called to Mass, to the Mass. The Mass, uh, the Roman Catholic idea of the Mass uh, has the idea that Jesus uh, becomes that uh, little wafer that uh, we call it, uh, uh, I've forgotten the name of it now, but uh, it, they literally believe that Jesus becomes the wafer and the wine and uh, that when you eat it, uh, you're, as it were, receiving Christ literally. Uh, and so we don't believe that. We're not called to that sort of uh, centerpiece of, and it's certainly not Christian worship when you understand the meaning of the mass. So the problem of the promise keepers is that uh, unity was promoted at the expense of biblical doctrine. Well, a lot of the pastors and leaders uh, who had that gift of prophecy, they could see down the road uh, that there was something wrong with this movement. And it was only time that brought out a number of these things uh, as to what the problems with the Promise Keeper movement was. The Promise Keeper movement is still alive today, but um, not as uh, vigorous as it used to be. When someone with a gift of prophecy warns you that a tendency or a direction in your life is not right, then don't just brush it off. Listen to what they say and ask the Lord to show you whether you should continue to do that thing, uh, you know, or whether you should continue to head in that direction. Now, the person with the gift of prophecy is not infallible, but it is worthwhile if someone who has that gift comes to you and expresses their concern, it is worthwhile examining yourself to see if what they've said bears some truth that you need to take heed to. In Romans chapter 14, verse 22, it says, Hast thou faith? That faith there is not talking about faith as far as salvation, but it's talking about uh, studying the Word of God to see whether a certain practice is uh, something you have liberty to pursue or uh, whether it uh, is not. And it says, uh, hast thou faith? In other words, have you studied Scripture and found that you are free to do a particular uh, thing? Then have that to yourself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. So if a person with the gift of prophecy expresses concern about something, I know years ago there was a man who I know had a gift of prophecy and he uh, he came to me one time and he expressed his concern uh, that uh, Christians ought not to uh, borrow money to buy a house. And uh, he was very, uh, very strong on this particular issue uh, but as I studied scripture, I found that uh, uh, the Bible did not uh, teach that, that there are certain times when we are uh, authorized to uh, borrow money. And I think in, in uh, a case like uh, buying, borrowing money to buy a house, that uh, there's some wisdom in doing that. So in this particular case, happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing uh, which he alloweth. The third insight about those with the gift of prophecy is that they often come alongside to encourage. Acts chapter 15 verse 32 says, And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. So we see that Judas and Silas, who were prophets at that time, uh, they not only at that particular time uh, foretold the future, but here we see that being prophets, they encouraged the brethren with many words and they confirmed them, they strengthened them in their faith. Now those with a gift of prophecy are usually people oriented. There are certain gifts that are people oriented and there are certain gifts which are more project oriented. Uh, well, the gift of prophecy is, is people oriented and uh, a person with a gift of prophecy has a true concern for people. It's not something fake. It's a genuine concern for people. And yet sometimes prophets are avoided as spoil sports and legalists. Some react angrily to the exercise of this gift, not only as they attempt to give the gospel to the lost, but as they try to help believers 
to live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world as grace teaches us. As it says in Titus chapter 2 uh, and verse, uh, uh, verse 11 and 12, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. So the prophet, he desires to help people to live soberly, righteously and godly. But sometimes uh, Christians, uh, not only the lost uh, react when they hear the gospel, but sometimes Christians react uh, when uh, the prophet comes along and wants to help them to uh, live a more righteous and godly life than they're presently living. So as a result, we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20, it says, despise not prophesying. Now, this is a, one of those verses that has double application. We could say that uh, it's, uh, in one sense, it's talking about uh, when you go to church, don't despise the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, there are some people who go to church just for the fellowship and uh, for what they, you know, the friendships that are developed there. In church, some people go for the singing. They love the singing. They love the music. Uh, so they go to church for that uh, reason. Um, and some people just sort of put up with the preaching, uh, the telling forth of the word of God. And the Bible says, don't despise prophesying in that sense. But a second, there's a secondary sense uh, that's related to the gift of prophecy. And that is, don't get angry when the prophet exercises his or her gift. Uh, the word despise there in 1 Thessalonians 5.20, it means to treat with contempt or to set at naught or to hold someone in least esteem. So you have a picture of this guy who's getting very frustrated, it seems, uh, when the prophet's coming along, whispering in his ear, so to speak, uh, that uh, he ought to be doing something else uh, or, or changing path or whatever. And uh, he's, uh, he doesn't like being challenged there. And so he's, in his mind at least, he's treating that uh, prophet with contempt, setting them at naught and maybe holding them in the least esteem at that particular moment of time. So to despise prophesying is to push aside the prophet's advice as the ramblings of a peculiar personality and to think, I don't need this message when in fact you just might need it. It may be God who is using that prophet to speak to your heart about your need to adjust some things in your life. So do you identify with this motivation? Uh, maybe you have a gift of prophecy. If uh, you can see some things which are familiar uh, in uh, the description I've given so far. Maybe you can think of someone who might have this gift as I was doing this study. I was thinking of a couple of people in our church that I believe have the gift of prophecy. I'm not sure that they know that they have the gift of prophecy, but I think uh, as I examined a number of things uh, and look at uh, uh, some things about the gift of prophecy in further detail, that uh, they, very, they very likely have this particular gift. Next week, we're going to take a deeper look at the gift of prophecy and say, see how it looks when the person who has this gift is spirit filled. And then we're going to look at what it looks like when they're not spirit filled, when they're actually carnal uh, and how they can misuse their spiritual gift. And uh, we'll also look at an example of a person who had the gift of prophecy in the New Testament after Pentecost when the gifts, the spiritual gifts were given out. And so uh, we're going to, to be doing that. Uh, we trust that it will be a blessing and a help. And uh, perhaps if you have this, this gift and you're just still not quite sure, hopefully uh, it will be able to clarify it even further for you next week. And uh, if you don't have the gift of prophecy, you'll be able to say, no, that's definitely not me. Uh, so in one way or another, you'll either be able to identify that you have the gift of prophecy or you'll be able to identify that you don't. So uh, in, and until then, let's uh, close in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to help us to discover our spiritual gift. Lord, we give you praise, Lord, for this opportunity to study together. And as, as we go through this unusual subject of spiritual gifts, 
Lord, help us to be able to be discerning. We pray for the Spirit of God to give us insight and illumination, Lord, into the spiritual gift that you have equipped us with. And then once we know what our spiritual gift is, help us to use it, uh, Lord, to minister to one another and also, Lord, uh, to be able to glorify your name. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.